Salutations, respective viewers. I'm George from Ireland. So here I am standing six feet above Thomas de Quincey, who is uh, most renowned for uh, publishing uh, his Confessions of an Opium Eater. So um, Thomas de Quincey uh, was born in Manchester in uh, 1785. And his father was a highly prosperous uh, businessman. Um, so they, they were brought up um, in, in the Church of England. He had, he had a few siblings. But uh, when he was only eight years old, his father died. Uh, incidentally, the name was actually Quincy originally, not De Quincy. And um, three years after his father died, um, uh, Quincy's mother decided to change the, the name to De Quincy. Um, so I suppose it was an aristocratic pretension putting this sort of French de on the front as a meaning of or from. Now, it is, a, it is a Norman name if you go back to the 11th century. That's why you'll find Quincy's in Ireland as well, um, who are Irish but of some sort of uh, distant Norman ancestry. What else about it? And, and actually, when they wrote it, they used to write de Quincy as two separate words. Um, so uh, Thomas de Quincey, he was always a, a bookish type. Uh, he um, really surpassed his peers at school. He went to Manchester Grammar School. At the age of 15, uh, one of his teachers said that, um, that the, the boy had achieved absolute mastery of Greek and would be able to uh, deliver an oration um, uh, before, um, before the assembly in Athens. And the idea is he would carry on at school for a few years and um, win a scholarship to one of the Oxford colleges. Didn't really need a scholarship because um, they were still very affluent. His father had left a lot of money behind um, in his will. But um, after about a year and a half of that, um, Thomas de Quincey said, bugger that for a game of soldiers. And he hit upon a novel idea that he was going to um, live as an itinerant and wander around rural Wales. I'm not quite sure why was he sort of gathering material for future writings. So um, his family were obviously not thrilled about the idea, thinking, thinking um, you know, it was slightly dangerous. Well, okay, there were a few high women around. There were a lot of turnpikes by then, so not as many as there had been before. But, uh, you know, a wealthy man, young man walking around, you could easily be robbed. Or um, what else? Just, just catch cold, catch your death of cold pneumonia. You know, we didn't have a lot of waterproof clothing in those days. Um, but uh, his uncle said, well, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a guinea, a guinea a week to live off. That's one pound, one shilling, which was a very considerable sum back then. You know, bear in mind that um, five pounds would buy you a decent horse in those days. Five thousand pounds was the top judge's salary at the time. So um, living off sort of 60 odd pounds a year was not that bad. Very doable, especially if you're supposedly not going to pay for accommodation, sleep rough or something. Never take the stagecoach. Um, so he agreed. So he began um, his uh, Kumrick uh, uh, adventure. So it was like something out of, out of a picaresque novel, I suppose. He was always very um, or bohemian. But when I come on to his political views, you'll find that they're not quite what one might imagine. But uh, he eventually failed to keep up with his, um, with his uncle as corresponding, as in to informing them of his whereabouts. And so the money was stopped. It was the only weapon the family had to make him come back to them. And remember, he could obviously drop out of school if he wanted to. There was no compulsory schooling at the time whatsoever. And although legal majority was, was uh, 21, a lot of children were working as soon as they could walk. And the legal age of marriage was 12 at the time. Now, admittedly, it was highly unusual to get married quite that young. If you got married at 16, that wouldn't have been abnormal, particularly for a girl. Um, but anyway, he eventually gave that up and he was persuaded to, uh, to go up to Oxford. So at Oxford University, he went up to, my goodness, I don't remember, I think it was Worcester College, which had been founded only about 100 years before. Obviously, some of them go back much later, so, well, so back to 1249, but go back much earlier rather, or possibly even before that, depends what you believe. But um, anyway, so De Quincey, uh, he was obviously studying classics, but he was fed up of formal learning and um, he was really fixated with the, with the, with the Romantic movement and um, had become um, a votary of uh, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, Charles Lamb and so forth. Um, was uh, deeply inspired by their writings and um, found uh, the classical curriculum at Oxford rather uninspiring. It was obviously mostly Latin and um, ancient Greek and he felt that he already had us under his belt anyway. He wasn't learning anything. So um, he failed one of his exams. They were all, they were all oral and in Latin in those days. Um, but leaving without a degree was, was, was not really a disgrace. Um, a lot of undergraduates went up without any intention of graduating, spend a year or two and then go down. And having any experience of tertiary education put them 
well ahead of almost everybody else. You must remember there was no compulsory schooling in the United Kingdom until 1870. Now, already by this time, we're talking about around about 1805, most people could read and write, even if to a very uh, low level. Um, so very few people went to secondary school and almost nobody went to university, about 1% of the population. Um, but there was no serious pressure on him to earn a living. And at the age of um, uh, one and 20, he came into, he reached man's estate. He came into his inheritance. He inherited 2,000 pounds from uh, the estate of his uh, long deceased father. So uh, that was gonna tide him over very nicely. And he decided to become a freelance journalist. Now the country was in political ferment. Remember the Napoleonic Wars were raging, radical Nostra were abroad, um, the Tory government of the day um, was very concerned, thinking that the United Kingdom was a pre-revolutionary stage and um, had severely circumscribed freedom of expression and had broadened the definition of sedition. Um, so even though those who proposed sweeping reform might fall foul of the law then, um, I won't go into the whole thing then, but you know, uh, who would be the prime ministers? Well, there'd been um, obviously Pitt, there'd been Joseph Addington, there'd been the Duke of Portland, latterly Spencer Percival, and then indeed the Earl of Liverpool. Um, so these Tory prime ministers uh, were really uh, not too keen on uh, civil liberty, suspending habeas corpus and, and that and then so on. So he wrote for various magazines, he moved to Edinburgh and then he edited a magazine there, the Westminster Gazette, even though it was based in Edinburgh. Um, I'm not quite sure why it was based here, but Edinburgh had a thriving intellectual life and um, there's a lot of lively debates in the pages of these, gen of these journals. These things were for long attention spans. They'd be articles of several thousand words um, and they would be very wordy, a very challenging vocabulary. Um, however, he wasn't doing things on time and he fell foul of the proprietor. So uh, eventually he was let go. So he tried to sustain himself by th freelance journalism um, because his liberality with his money meant that um, he was um, soon more or less penniless. He did manage to meet his uh, literary heroes because um, he had idolized Wordsworth in particular. Now significantly Coleridge, of whom uh, uh, De Quincey was a great fan, um, had experimented very extensively with drugs, particularly opium. You may know about that person from Porlock who interrupted him. Um, in Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure cloaked dome decree and on all the rest of it. Um, so uh, the abuse of these substances perhaps it gave rise to some literary uh, gems. What else about um, uh, these two? So opium was manufactured in India and in China, well mainly in India, was sold here um, as a recreational thing and there was no age limit on it as well. So the United Kingdom was very libertarian with regard to drugs but not with regard to um, expression whether in writing, on the stage, um, or, um, well, that would be it. You know, newspapers, magazines are on the stage, obviously no radio at the time. Uh, anyway, so um, he started using opium quite heavily. He'd first tried at the age of 19 and he got very much into it. He got married, he had eight children, um, but he wasn't a very responsible father. Um, anyway, he uh, later wrote about his drug experiences and in a way it seems not to have damaged his health too much. He, to some degree, he was self-medicating against neuralgia from his, uh, from his early 20s. Um, and now coming on to his political opinions, because he used drugs, that might lead you to surmise that he was a radical. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. His opposition to reform was adamantine. Um, he thought that uh, most men ought to be excluded from the franchise. He uh, was uh, dead against uh, Catholic emancipation, as to say, granting um, uh, equal rights to the Catholic minority. Of course, in Ireland, we were the majority. And he thought the Peter Lou Massacre had been absolutely the right thing to do when in Manchester, is his um, hometown when this uh, reformist demonstration in 1819 took place at St Peter's Fields and a magistrate said to the, the, the yeoman, clear that crowd, and they charged in and killed about a dozen unarmed people. Um, he thought that that was a many splendid thing, um, cutting down these unarmed people with sabres. It led Shelley, the radical poet, to write the Mask of Anarchy in protest. Um, and uh, let me see what else. When it came to the Indian mutiny of 1857, he thought the mutineers um, were uh, unutterably evil and he praised the loyal Indians to the moon, but he said those sepoys who had mutinied must be hammered. Uh, he was also dead against slavery. He didn't see any, any contradiction in that. Um, doesn't have to be a contradiction, but um, obviously at least he's right on one issue, opposing servitude. Um, so in, in the 20th century, it tend to be liberals and left-wingers who uh, experiment with drugs and thought that all laws ought to be liberalized on the issue. But um, in the 19th century, it's kind of the other way around because um, 
Tories and maybe even some Whigs saying, yeah, do what you want because um, people have their right to take these things and it's free trade. And then um, radicals and eventually socialists said, no, come on, we must restrict these things because they see the social harm that it does. Um, so that was it. He was, he was taking it. He did manage to go up to 61 days without it. So he fell into debt and it was in danger of the creditors having him nabbed and, and thrown into prison. Remember, until the 1820s, debt was a criminal matter, not a civil matter. Then um, Sir Robert Peel became the Home Secretary and reform on the, the law on this issue. Remember in London there was um, Newgate Prison for debtors. So in uh, Edinburgh he often had to take refuge in Holyrood Abbey. Uh, so there were no monks there by that time, but it was still there. But it still had that medieval tradition of sanctuary, of you couldn't be arrested there. So I had to hide out there for weeks at a time. However, on Sunday he was free to wander around because people couldn't be arrested for debt upon a Sunday. Um, so uh, that was him. And he lived in Edinburgh for, um, for most of his life, actually, from, from about the age of 21, and, and contributed to various magazines, uh, published a number of novels, and um, his work was acclaimed even in his lifetime. Um, in recent decades, he's more or less been uh, lost to remembrance. Anyway, so he died um, in 1859, so uh, the drugs obviously didn't kill him, though he's taking plenty of those. Uh, that's him. Uh, so. Thomas de Quincey, who certainly led a um, scintillating and uh, life, not a very virtuous one, who died in 1859. Look him up.